So welcome everyone uh, to the Pond University meetup on blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Uh, so glad that you could make it uh, the November cold evening. Uh, I saw like most people, you know, I took a train, a uh, commuter train uh, to South Station, and there were like five people getting off the train. There were like 150 people trying to get into the train, trying to rush back home. Uh, so I'm glad to see you all. How many of you are attending the Pond University meetup for the first time? Okay, so welcome all. Uh, how many of you are returning uh, members? Okay, so glad to see you guys again. Um, so today, uh, we are going to do something interesting. Uh, we have a, a bunch of workshops lined up for 2018, and we've been putting together a lot of material, and we thought that we'd share some of the material with you guys. Um, so Anish, uh, who's here, who's our expert in machine learning and AI, and uh, he's putting together a workshop on uh, analyzing cryptocurrencies and doing a lot of machine learning. Uh, and then Duru, who is actually based out of Chicago, and he's dialing in from Chicago, so he's our expert on blockchain. So he's going to be doing a segment on blockchains, and uh, uh, Anish is going to be doing a segment on uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, but to kick this off, so we have Dan, uh, who, uh, Dan Fasciano, who's uh, uh, you know, uh, at BNY Mellon, and uh, I'll do a formal introduction in a bit. So he is, graciously agreed to kick off the event to talk about the relevance and also the importance of fintech uh, for a 21st century quant or financial professional. And uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about you know, what quant university is what, because we see a lot of people in the room, so I'll just give you a brief <coughs> and then I'll hand off the stage to uh, our speakers. Um, the slides and uh, sample code, which is in Python, will be available in here. Uh, for people who have signed up using the splash that page, we'll send out an email. And for people who have signed up on the meetup, we'll just post a link there, so we don't have to take any notes. Okay, um, okay so what have we been doing in the last couple of years? So Bond University started as an analytics advisory, and we primarily, you know, I was a resident quant at uh, MathWorks, and for more than five years, I was basically helping people build models at MathWorks. And I saw in 2013 that there was this need of you know, bringing in machine learning and AI and open source and uh, kind of getting all these solutions into the quant world. And I started this company called Quant University. And we've been a B2B company. We've been primarily doing consulting and trading operations for a lot of financial companies. Uh, I usually go to New York and DC and New Jersey, and that's where most of my clients are. We have a lot of clients in the Boston area too. Uh, and last year, we opened up saying we'll do B2C, which is kind of you know, run programs and certificate programs uh, for the public rather than just doing B2B uh, kind of an operation. So we've been launching a couple of different programs. Uh, we have uh, an analytics certificate program, which basically is geared towards people who are enthusiasts in analytics and wanting to build different data science related applications. And in uh, 2018, we're going to be launching a fintech certification program. So that's going to be looking at the various facets of fintech and seeing how you can actually understand uh, the various uh, the landscape of fintech and the various players in that space. Uh, all that information will be available in the link I sent you. Uh, and we have starting the inaugural cohort for the spring 2018. So if you're interested, please send us a note and we'll just send you more information. Uh, the uh, analytics certificate program is also starting in spring 2018. So if you're interested, please take a look at it. Um, so the way we are structuring our programs, we are calling it Explore, Experience, and Excel. Uh, Explore is, you know, you're getting your feet wet, and you're just trying to understand the landscape of various solutions. You want to understand what this is about. For example, you're trying to get an orientation on FinTech, or you're trying to get an orientation on you know, the technologies one should know when you are trying to do that. Uh, we call these the Explore programs because you are not really trying to get in-depth knowledge in a particular field. So we do these two-day workshops to get you an overview of various technologies and tools. Uh, and then we have our two-day experience workshops, which we take a particular theme and we put together programs specifically for that particular theme. So the samples you're going to see today uh, is primarily for the experience use of workshops. So we have one workshop coming up on blockchains, another one coming up on machine learning and AI for finance, and you're going to see some samples of the kinds of applications you're going to be building when you take these experience workshops. 
Uh, and the final one is what we call as the Excel-based programs. And the Excel programs are either eight-week or 13-week uh, long programs. And the FinTech certificate program and the analytics certificate programs are examples of those, wherein you commit to a whole three-month program where you go through various modules, build case studies, hands-on examples, and you kind of uh, you know, build your knowledge in that particular area. So um, a couple of events, if you are interested, uh, we are going to be doing a webinar in partner partnering with MathWorks. Uh, that's happening on December 6th. It's a free webinar. I'm going to share the link, and you can just, if you're at your desk and you want to hear something about what people do with risk management in the context of machine learning and AI. So that's a good opportunity. And the samples you're going to be seeing today will be launched formally in January. And in January, we're going to have a two-day workshop on machine learning and AI and finance in Boston. And it's also going to be streamed online. And there's going to be a blockchain workshop which is going to happen in Chicago and we'll stream that online. And in February, we're going to do a swap. We're going to do the on-site workshop in Boston for blockchains. And we're going to do the machine learning workshop in Chicago. And we're going to be circulating it. You know, we'll also have some programs in New York and uh, Washington, D.C. as we go. Uh, we have a, a plan to launch eight workshops in 2018. Um, so we would really welcome your thoughts and uh, if you have any specific things you would like us to do in 2018, we would love to kind of hear from you. Okay, so let's um, kind of talk a little bit about what FinTech is about. You know, you've been hearing about FinTech for a long time and we have kind of looked at FinTech in the context of eight specific areas. Uh, the first one is payments. We have done a bunch of meetups in the, uh, in the payment space. Uh, so you see like payment uh, companies like you know, PayPal and Square launching different solutions and you want to kind of get you an orientation of what uh, the kinds of applications are in payments. Uh, the second uh, module is blockchain. And blockchain module you're going to see today, what Drew is going to present, is going to be a part of the blockchain series of uh, workshops we're putting together. Um, and then we have trading and investments where you have robo-advisors, investment management, um, and then planning for retirement planning, which are trying to look at different applications in the retirement space. Uh, and then lending, you've been hearing about P2P um, lending and uh, recently the Federal Reserve has kind of uh, started talking about, well, P2P, the way it's going, it looks like you know, subprime markets uh, we back in 2007, so uh, something to be uh, uh, aware of. Uh, and then you have insurance, and a lot of new applications in insurance are coming up. Uh, and then big data and analytics, and what Anish is going to be presenting is going to be a workshop in the big data and analytics space. And then we have cybersecurity, authentication, and encryption. Uh, Duru is going to spend a little bit of time talking about the kind of technologies which are typically used when you build these kinds of applications. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, what we had in terms of introduction to Quant University. We'll be offline. We'll be available offline in case you have any questions. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dan Fasciano. So Dan um, has been uh, you know, a champion for fintech and financial professionals in the Boston area for a long time. Uh, he was the chair at uh, the uh, Boston Security Analyst, Analyst Society or the CFA Boston Society. And he's also involved with the President's Council. And uh, we had a good chat over the weekend talking about uh, you know, where the finance profession is going and the kinds of things which people would want to be uh, aware of when you're kind of building your career as financial professional and also uh, looking at what all is happening in the technology world. Uh, so I'd like Dan to come down and share his thoughts on you know, why this is interesting and then we'll kind of uh, start with that technical discussion. So, you know what's great? Packed room here, and I see that even at this level, the front row is always the toughest one to fill. I'm sitting up there alone, so thank you. You know, so, uh, Shree's a longtime friend, and when I signed up about a week ago, or actually I sent an email to Shree, I said, geez, this is awesome. What do you think? Can I come? Or, or would it be good for me to come? And he said, well, yeah, as long as you plan on giving about a five-minute intro. And I said, well, geez, that's just not right. That's not the plan here. So we did have a great conversation. The problem was I was in my car driving back from my place in New Hampshire. So all of this stuff is kind of like I didn't know it was coming. And, but let me explain why I think I'm here. Uh, and the best part about this for me is it's really meant to be selfish for you. Like any message I have isn't so much about the industry, but it's really trying to get to you as kind of 
uh, in your career, no matter where you are, and I have a, a few familiar faces already, my sense is there's a range of experiences and expectations in this room, which is awesome. I think that there are people from the financial side, people from the business side, people from the academic side, people earlier in their career, people a little bit further along in their career like myself. So um, let me just tell you, I think the two salient bits from that, that probably, um, as Sri said, it, um, you know, that I graciously allowed to be here. And that is number one, I'm a managing director of BNY Mellon Wealth Management. So having been in the industry almost 30 years now, you know, I've seen uh, the tried and true, I've seen some great ideas come and go, uh, and, and FinTech broadly is something that we at my firm are fascinated by, but probably healthfully skeptical around. And I think of something like BNY Mellon as beta, and the concepts or the ideas around FinTech is really kind of alpha. There's gonna be a lot of high fail rates. I went to a, I was invited to give a very similar, I sat on a panel actually, uh, at, a, at an investment bank, technology oriented iBank, uh, seminar about a year ago with maybe twice as many people in the room and, and they were guffawing because I obviously anchored the Luddite part of that panel. You know, it was the old BNY Mellon and I said, well the good news is we've been around for 200 years and I'll bet you half of you, you know, won't be doing what you're doing in two or three years. So, you know, before you finish guffawing, you know, that's the idea, high risk, high payoff in terms of FinTech and, and I'm coming at it from kind of a BNY Mellon wealth management type uh, background. I think the real reason why I'm here, I think the reason why Sri uh, keyed in on me is maybe uh, in my role at the CFA Institute. So I have a very active volunteer life. I was telling a friend, Mark, earlier, um, the CFA Institute asked me to calculate with some precision my volunteer time. It worked out to a little more than 800 hours last year, um, just being involved with other people in the industry globally. In fact, I'll tell you, on my way here on the, on the red line, uh, three weeks ago I was in Jordan giving a speech to 150 fellow investment leaders, and I felt a little bit more out of place coming here now, because you just don't know what you're wading into on a FinTech conversation or on a blockchain conversation than I did there. There I knew what I was gonna say, I knew where it was going. Here I'm like, Eesh. I don't know. Um, but let me, let me pull that CFA Institute experience forward and share it with you and, and maybe really get to you. So I'm hoping the next hour and a half or, or a little uh, less will really kind of motivate you and at whatever level you're at to take it another step further. I'm praying that's what happens. And selfishly, the third thing I'm bringing here is I'm, I'm Boston through and through. I mean, I'm, I'm a product of the city of Boston. I'm thankful that Sri and the others have brought us physically in this room because we must continue try to lead the way to be out in front of this. And, and these are the people giving up your night to be here, to meet each other, to try to leverage off each other that's gonna make that happen. So, you know, beyond the global part of my volunteerhood, hopefully someone in this room or people in this room are gonna take it forward. So at the CFA Institute, just so you know, standing behind you, watching you, if you get this right or if we get this right, right now are 150,000 charter holders globally. We're in 173, no, 159 countries. Um, and last year we had about a quarter of a million people sit for the exam. There are exam centers in China right now where 5,000 people will show up in June to take the exam. It is ferocious what's going on out there. But that's that part of it. Um, in 2013, the Institute, probably looking at FinTech and some other things, said, listen, it's great that we're teaching all these kind of underlying concepts, you know, what's behind the PE ratio and ROE and how do you calculate duration and convexity and all that stuff, but we need to kind of be forward looking. So they came up with this notion around the future of finance and part of that was FinTech and saying, listen, we want to get behind it. We want to be supportive. We want our members to be part of the narrative, but we also want to remember there are kind of clients and stakeholders and others out there that we want to be tethered to and rooted to and be accountable to. Because when you think about it, wasted capital could have been deployed in a more efficient place. I mean, you don't have to go back to 2008, but you know, chasing pipe dreams and, and you know, ideas that are going nowhere is just a useless waste of capital. So they wanted to be tethered and part of that conversation. In fact, they came up with a quote in 2013 that was as pertinent then as it is tonight for all of you, and it's, Think about this and what you're doing. I wrote the quote down. 
to shape a trustworthy, forward-thinking financial industry that better serves society. You know, it sounds highfalutin, but when you think about it, I mean, listen, I want to make money like all of you want to make money. I'm not doing this out of altruism, but being tethered to something kind of larger and, and, and being accountable to that matters. So a couple things that have come out of that future of finance that I thought were germane to this evening, uh, and you can take them or leave them. Uh, there was a survey done in 2016 by the Institute to, to kind of the investing public. Uh, and, and one data or two data points that came out of this, 77% of the public that was surveyed trust the technology in front of them. 77% trust the technology. Whereas this, within that same universe or that same population of those surveyed, 61% uh, in, in trusted their financial services firm. So when you think about it, technology in a sense has a jump in terms of trust already. People trust their app or what they're looking at more than they trust a jerk like me. A couple other pieces that came out of that survey that I think are relative to tonight are uh, when polled, and I think this is kind of telling in developed in terms of developed public versus kind of emerging or growth areas. Uh, what will be more important three years from now, in that, very, in that same survey, what will be more important three years from now to you? Having access to the latest technology or having access to a skilled person, a skilled professional in the investment industry? In the US, 27% said what would really drive them is technology, whereas 73% said having access to a skilled professional. Just putting it out there, I'm not gonna argue with it. So roughly three to one. In India, same exact question. Those in India that responded, 64% said technology, 36% said a skilled person. So it almost speaks more to trust in the emerging countries. I guess they just trust us a little bit more in America. But now we did it by kind of age cohort, so globally age cohort. For those 65 and older, 24% said access to technology, 76% said access to a person. For those 25 to 34, Roughly 50-50, 50-50 said in three years from now I want access to technology or I want access to. So you can see that, and I'll say this kind of firsthand, we acknowledge this at BNY Mellon, they don't have a lot of money yet, but they are influencers and they're moving in that direction. So you know whether they're gonna inherit it or earn it, that next gen coming through has a much higher level of, of, of need and demand and pull uh, for technological uh, solutions. So, uh, a few things that the CFA Institute really believes strongly in now, and, and I think this is all I really want to leave with, and, and you can all interpret this individually in your own way, is, and, and I let this wash over me at a very personal level, you know, technology is happening, and there will be winners or losers. One can be, and I, I call this kind of the active and passive argument about technology, one can be active, and, and I'm here, well, I'm gonna tell you what, I'm, what my selfish takeaway was, why I reached out to Shri, and you can and hopefully take it for yourself. I am striving to see what the dots are, to see them kind of sprayed out in front of me, to reinforce them. I'm gonna take things I hear tonight, I'm gonna to go to another conference, I'm gonna see if I hear similar things, and what I'm gonna do is build a mosaic, that's what we call it in, in, in the CFA Institute, and I'm gonna connect those dots for my own selfish self. And I'm gonna say, well, that's a winner, and that's a loser, that goes nowhere. If you can connect those dots and build a picture in your mind and pro forma that or project that out and really actively embrace that and be a part of it, to us, that's the solution. Or you can wait for it all, all to happen and play a monster game of catch up and maybe even get disrupted. You know, and, and when I look at what's happening just purely on the robo side, you know, that is a classic disruptive type approach. We at BNY Mellon have no, no response to that right now, and we see it coming up from kind of, you know, cheaper, lower cost solution. And, and at the moment, we're doing all the right things strategically, but we have to sit there and watch it. It doesn't hit a market that we serve. So me sitting in this room tonight, listening to you, hopefully making a few new friends before I go, is really me trying to see those dots and connect them take them away selfishly, and down the line try to figure out how we can or I can profit from it. So no matter what you're doing and where you are, what I would ask, because I don't have some solution painted in front of me, try to do the same thing, make some new friends, let's kind of lead the way, let's not hurt or penalize or, or, or do anything that's kind of unethical in the process, and let's just stay right out in front of it. I mean, so Shrey, I'll kind of leave it at that, 
you know, hopefully I've kind of touched at least a few of you in terms of what you take away tonight, and now I'll let the really smart guys, people take over and, and take you through the rest of the evening. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ben, for an excellent introduction. Uh, next, I would like to talk a little bit about Duru, who has been helping put together this uh, blockchain workshop. Now, how many of you have heard about an asset which has grown 600% in the last year or so? What's that asset? Bitcoin. You have it in your portfolio. Yeah. Come on, you can be open here. No one's going to ask me. So, um, has anyone lost any money in the last week or so investing in this asset? Oh, okay. No? Okay. Value or money? Um, <laughs> have you done? Is there an asset which has been swinging 30% in the last week or so? If you're following the news, you know, you'd just be surprised with the kinds of asset dynamics which has been happening with these assets. Right? Um, if you had invested in Bitcoin, uh, what was that, September 15th or so, you'd have doubled your money. Uh, now, when people talk about Bitcoin, they're all fascinated with these trends and what's happening out there, the new currencies which are out there. Uh, so we saw it from two perspectives. One, as a financial professional, I was a quantic city group before, you know, doing fixed income modeling, asset modeling, and done a lot of stuff with portfolio optimization. I can never think of an asset which actually has this kind of a profile. So I wanted to kind of see if we can study the asset dynamics and see if we can use statistical and tools quants know and think about how we can analyze it. And we structured this uh, machine learning AI workshop and uh, Anish is going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, but I started talking to people about blockchain and uh, I see like various degrees of interest um, I was kind of telling Anish earlier that you know, uh, in my uh, uh, one of my acquaintances who actually does real estate for a living uh, spends between six o'clock to nine o'clock in the evening just looking at Coinbase to get the charts, doing investing. And he says like, I'm not doing any showings between six and nine in the evening, so I'm not going to go out. I'm just going to be looking at these assets. So a lot of people are getting to it. So a lot of people don't really know what's under the hood. So we thought it may be a good idea to put together a workshop where we actually get under the hood to understand the technology. Not just in the context of cryptocurrencies, but in the context of what's the underlying technology of blockchain which is enabling all these new assets to come into play. But also looking at the big picture on what are the possible applications with blockchain? Now what is DLT? What is the science behind it? And Duru uh, has got a PhD in computer science from the University of Chicago. He's a faculty member at DePaul, so he understands this technology very intimately, and uh, he has been putting together this workshop. Uh, so what we will do is, um, Duru is based out of Chicago, so we are going to be streaming his session live for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll hand off to Anish, who's going to do a presentation on analysis of cryptocurrencies, and then we'll open up for free. Okay. That's the Uh, hello, Duru. You are live now. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. 
I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm assuming you're gonna hear me. Uh, my name is Dr. Golo. Uh, I'm excited to join uh, Quant University to lead the blockchain technology workshops. And I'm gonna start my uh, presentation. First, let me uh, start the screen share. system that is open to everybody. Uh, anyone can audit the ledger. Uh, transactions are irreversible. Basically, once a transaction posts, that's it. You can't reverse it. Uh, the ledger, therefore, is immutable. And most importantly, there is no central authority controlling the system. These four properties are essential to the blockchain technology, and uh, I'm going to discuss how these properties make a better and more secure system instead of the existing conventional ledgers that we have today. Um, so before going into the details, I would like to first point out that uh, Bitcoin is the culmination of years of research uh, in several fields of computer science. And the genius in uh, Bitcoin is to bring together these seemingly unrelated parts into one system and introduce an incentive mechanism that rewards honest behavior. So there are two main topics I would like to cover uh, uh, in the history of blockchain. First of the first uh, topic is public key cryptography, which is mainly used to secure communications between many parties. You can think of uh, major communications or communications over the internet. And uh, this uh, technology, uh, starting in the 70s and 90s, 80s, uh, the developments in cryptography enabled us to use internet safely, even though uh, the communications go through multiple channels and it, the, all the communications are exposed to multiple parties. Even then, uh, the communications stay safe because of the cryptography behind it. Another application of cryptography was introduced by Guard Time, which is a cryptographic form of patenting uh, inventions or some information without revealing the secret information at the time. Uh, this is done by uh, taking the information and then uh, bringing it down to a digest of some seemingly random string. And producing that string is very hard. So you need to have the initial information to produce that string. So you can basically uh, just post that string in the, in, in the current time. And then in the future, if you need to show that actually you indeed have the information at that time, you can. Uh, as requested or as needed in the future, you can just uh, reveal the secret information and then the digest would match and then that would prove that you have the information all along. So these examples as they are, these are the examples that are used in blockchain technology in securing ownership and the history of the ledger. I'm going to explain more about this in further slides. And another avenue of research focused on the dis in, in the blockchain industry is, uh, is a decentralization problem. And more specifically, it's the consensus problem. Just imagine there are so many nodes in our network, and the, we need to design a scheme, that, uh, design a scheme that, uh, that's going to make the nodes agree on the current state of the ledger. Well, if this is solved, this, if this problem is solved, then we could use a solution to create a digital form of money, because we would have a ledger and the majority of the network or the, the entire network would accept it as, as such and then uh, you can basically use this money and you, this is exactly what Bitcoin has accomplished. Originally, uh, so the, the, we are talking about history, originally the first attempt was made by David Chong in DigiCash and uh, later another very important component in the blockchain technology was introduced by Hashcash. Uh, Hashcash introduced the idea of the concept of proof of work, and this is today is used 
as well as in the, the, uh, in the in blockchains, in many blockchains. So I will be discussing these ideas in greater detail later. At this point, I would like to emphasize that the genius behind Bitcoin. So all of these developments are very important, yes. But the genius in Bitcoin was to bring all of these seemingly unrelated ideas together under one roof, and also, additionally, Bitcoin was adding a monetary incentive mechanism to encourage honest behavior in the uh, node of the network. Speaking of which, uh, this genius was uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, an unknown person, or a group of people, uh, and uh, he or them uh, designed the uh, Bitcoin network in 2008. And another genius named Vitaly Buterin, this is a real person, another graduate uh, dropout, who received the Steel Fellowship uh, to drop out from college. Uh, he embarked on creating the Ethereum network in 2013. The two networks are very similar, but also they are different too. One of the big differences is in the scripting language they use. Bitcoin uses a much simpler language, while Ethereum uses a truly complete language. Uh, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm just going to go into the uh, implication of that. Uh, basically, a truly complete language allows any function uh, uh, feasible. Basically, you can, uh, in the Ethereum network, you can compute any function. When I say in function, I really mean, uh, I, or I really want to focus on legal contracts. Well, it is not too hard to visualize any contract uh, as a function. For example, uh, just consider a contract, a legal contract, that says if such and such conditions are met, then the payment is due. Well, uh, we can I mean, easily turn this into a function. It's, it's a piece of code. It, uh, it's an if statement checking the conditions, and then if the conditions are met, then the payment is going to be made. So, uh, using this function, the execution of the function can be automatically enforced in the Ethereum network. However, in real life, when people sign a contract, they may later back out of the contract. And there will be some legal challenges because of this. So, the, the advantage of the Ethereum network is that once the contract is agreed upon and signed by all parties, there is no turning back. It is the immutable uh, property of the blockchain that this allows this. So once you have signed on it, that's it. Basically, that contract is going to be enforced by the, by the nodes in the network. Uh, so this functionality brought a lot of attention to the Ethereum platform. And 2017 was the year of ICOs. Similar to the initial public offerings, the initial coin offerings raised capital to fund projects that use the Ethereum platform. Actually, the first ICO was using the Bitcoin network back in 2013, but since the introduction of the Ethereum network and the uh, and more powerful uh, 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 scripting language, Bitcoin now can be thought of as a store of value and Ethereum can be thought of as a worldwide computer. And executing legal agreements are called smart contracts. So lastly, there is ongoing work to take advantage of some of the, of the same fundamentals of blockchain technology in a private setting. Those are private blockchains. And also for the original public version, there is much interesting work going on uh, about the scaling problem. Uh, using state channels, transactions can take place off-chain and thus require much less time to compete. So uh, these are some uh, future work, uh, but let's first discuss Okay, uh, the problem that we are trying to solve, uh, uh, how to create a functioning ledger. For a functioning ledger, ownership must be easy to verify. And at the same time, other people should not be able to claim any funds that belong to the rightful owner. In other words, fabricating ownership should be extremely hard. This is for the safety of the funds held in the ledger. And in the other aspect, so this is the ownership aspect, ownership aspect, and in the ledger aspect, well, it, it would be not much of use if one cannot con uh, transact with the funds that they have. So in terms of the ledger itself, transactions should be very easy, and tampering with the overall ledger should be extremely hard. And these are the basic properties a functional ledger must have. 
Now, let us consider several forms of value in the real world and rate them according to these criteria. Okay, cash. So, uh, and also, uh, the, among all of these criteria, let's first start with the ownership question. And let's consider cash. How, is easy, how easy it is going to be to prove ownership? Okay. There is some cash out there, and I want to uh, make you believe that that cash is mine. So if, I mean, this is easy, I can show that that cash is in my wallet, and then that's it. It's mine. Uh, what if I have a lot of cash? Then either I have to, uh, I can't put that in my wallet, I have to carry a bag with me, or, I mean, I can, this is not so safe. So what do I do? I go to a bank and place it in a bag. Okay, uh, I can place the funds in a bank and then I can request a statement from the bank to prove that I have the funds. And everybody will honor that statement. However, there's a detail here that's somewhat overlooked. The money that you put in the bank is no longer yours. You can definitely withdraw, but it's not yours. Just compare this to the cash. It is very different. You hold the physical cash in your wallet and nobody can take it from you, but the, the funds in the bank is actually with the bank. Let's look at another, let's look at another example. Uh, a car or a house. How can you prove that you own them? Well, this is simple. The title or the deed to the property in question is enough, and these are registered with the government offices. So, this is this is easy. Well, uh, to summarize, in all of the existing settings, there is trust in a central authority. In the case of physical cash, it is the government printing. In money at banks, it's the banks. It's in real uh, property, uh, and, and in real property, it is the government offices which register such ownership information. Because of this requirement, tra required trust in the central entity, if ever the trust gets broken, the consequences could be devastating. For example, the bank may not give back your money, or may only offer partial access. Furthermore, there could be mistakes in record keeping in the central entity, and because of these issues, transactions usually are carried out with many intermediary parties for security purposes, and this results in high transaction fees to be charged. So, let me pause here a bit. Uh, the blockchain technology solves such problems, and what's remarkable is that it does not place trust in a central entity. So this is one of the main reasons why blockchain technology is better than the current systems we have. Now let's look at the uh, next criteria. The ownership information should not be easily fabricated. And we're going to look at this in a, um, in a setting where such fabrications mostly happen. And that setting is an owner spends his funds and would like to spend again the same funds. But at the time, after spending it, it should not be his to spend, but Anyway, he tries to spend me. So he's maybe trying to take, uh, take advantage of the recording delay, or you know, he's just trying his chances to get away with it. This issue is referred to as the double spending problem. And let us discuss the same scenarios we discussed before. Physical cash. Well, I cannot spend the physical cash in my wallet two times. It's impossible. Uh, I mean, I can maybe. Uh, Counterfeit money, use counterfeit money. Oh, that's illegal. So this is this is either very illegal or you know there is it's it's a little bit risky. Um, uh, the problem is one issue is I cannot transact with large amounts. Well, actually I can, but it's, that's also very risky. Instead, I can use the funds at the bank. And let's say I spend the funds and I want to spend again. The bank, of course, would not allow this. But you can try by writing checks that won't clear. So it is easy to try to spend what is not yours to spend. The issues are that either the transaction fees are high or the payments <coughs> or funds takes days and even after like so many days have passed, maybe the funds won't clear. So you need to wait like a week to see that the funds are yours to spend. Well, in, in, in the cars and real estate setting, People selling the same house to multiple people have been documented. And because of this, there is a thriving industry for real estate transactions. I mean, not, not just this, of course, and there are so many, uh, so many reasons why the real estate uh, industry is thriving. But uh, 
one of the reasons is, is the security aspect of it. So companies are there just to prove to the buyer that the seller is indeed the rightful owner. And he has not yet sold to, to anybody else, or uh, you know, the claims are true. So such problems in real life have made these transactions very slow, involving many intermediate parties. And in turn, such transactions have very high transaction fees associated with them. In summary, the conventional methods suffer from these proton activities. Sure, if the amount is small, there would be very little incentive to commit such proton activities. But there is a different story for those transactions with, transactions with high amounts. Because of this, um, there have been uh, prevention methods put in place. In fact, the central authority disallows double spend, but it may be too late for the buyer to realize this. So there have been multiple intermediary entry entities uh, involved in such transactions to make sure that the buyer and the seller are protected. This introduces a very high cost on the transactions themselves and makes them very slow. Again, I'm pausing here and looking at the blockchain solution. It is very remarkable. Uh, the blockchain itself this allows double spend and verifying ownership is such an easy task that you don't need any intermediaries to do this. It is basically, uh, we'll discuss this, it's, it's very simple and the, the, the ledger prevents double spend, so there are no such problems. Okay, finally, let's look at the ledger aspect. Um, so let us consider the quality of the ledger in terms of transactions and the maintenance of the ledger itself. The questions you would like to think about are, uh, are two. How easy is it to transact and how hard it is to tamper with the overall ledger? So just like before, let's consider physical cash. Transactions with physical cash are very easy. It's a physical exchange. It's, it's so easy. And the ledger is actually indeed very powerful. It is a distributed ledger. I mean, the ledger is basically stored in everybody's wallets. It's, it, it, is, it is amazing. And um, this is very nice, uh, but uh, it, this brings an issue where tech is very easy because, um, I mean, the, the funds are not secured. It's in my wallet, so somebody can take it, just attacking. Um, the other main issue is physical cash is not the only source of money, so uh, we need to really uh, look into uh, the, the entire source, uh, which is fiat currency. Um, most of the money in, this, uh, in the money supply rests in banks, and transacting within the same bank is very easy. So transactions are easy within the same bank. Uh, because the bank just writes off the funds from one account and puts it onto another account. This is this is just a computer. I mean, it's keyboard stroke, and that's that's it. Um, but if the transactions are taking place between different banks, this process can take days. And on the positive side, if the since the ledger is kept private in the banks, it is generally very hard to tamper with it. Uh, the main issues are the high transaction fees here, and also there is another um, uh, another issue that the banks have the power to create money and dilute the money supply. And this was the main reason about the recent financial crises, and why Bitcoin has emerged as a solution to this problem. So there are problems in the city too. Now let's consider the real assets. Once again, transactions are slow due to many uh, intermediate parties. But on the positive side, it's generally hard to tamper with the ledger unless you have bribed someone in the government office to produce false documents. Well, with such concerns, because those things also happened, uh, the industry has been taking care of itself by employing several intermediary parties to ensure the validity of the transactions that taking place. In summary, Conventional methods place trust in a single entity, and as such, the word of the central entity is to be trusted. In many settings, if there is any sort of discrepancy, the central entity, be it a bank or a government office, would assert that their data is the correct one. Because of this centralization, it becomes much easier to target such entities. Hackers and thieves can attack and steal valuable information and funds for their own benefit. Just consider the last, um, uh, social security attack, social security number attack. I mean, those information are stolen. 
because of the central entity. Another disadvantage is in the privacy of the auditing. Not everybody can go and check, the, check for the validity of the ledger. For example, I cannot just go to the bank and say, well, I want to look at the, the, how you're keeping the accounts. I want to see if it is correct. I cannot say that. So again, I'm pausing here and you know, looking at the blockchain solution. Blockchain solution is, is again remarkable in that all this ledger, so I'm not uh, explaining it in the slides, but I'm going to explain it now. Uh, the entire ledger is actually stored with everybody. So it is not centrally stored, it is stored with everybody, which means attacking one node is not going to mean anything. It's, I mean, you can use the same ledger stored with any other node. And because of this, uh, and because of the immutability, um, the blockchain ledger is, is impossible to tamper with. And it is publicly available for anyone to audit. So this makes it very secure. It is continuously audited by every full node in the network, so the validity of entire uh, history is never questioned. Uh, is, I mean, it's never going to be lost. However, this comes at a slight cost of smaller transactions. Okay, but uh, it is still much better than the, uh, the days that is required to transact with different banks. That the transactions in the, in the network maybe takes you know, minutes or an hour. But of course, what we would like uh, is to bring that down to seconds. Okay, so let's now discuss the blockchain solution. There are two parts to this, cryptography <coughs> and distributed systems. So first, uh, we are trying to, I'm going to try to explain the problem. The solution to ownership, it should be easy to verify and hard to fabricate. There we are using public key cryptography and uh, let me explain very briefly with a story. So uh, there are two parties, Alice and Bob, and Alice wants to send a message to Bob, and she wants him to know that it is a new parent who sent the message. How can Alice accomplish this? The answer is cryptography. Um, and applications in this, uh, that's internet, military com communications, etc. And uh, developments in cryptography, actually, this is the field, this is the reason why computer science was created back in the 1940s, because of the World War II, the military communications, uh, to be intercepted and to be decrypted. So this was the entire uh, uh, motivation that led uh, people to consider you know, the study of computer science. Okay, so illustration. Uh, Alice produces private and public keys, and she also sent a message, says, you know, hi, it's Alice to Bob. And what she does is she publishes, just like the name uh, implies, she publishes her public key for everyone to see, and then she encrypts the message, and then the message is some random looking string. She sends that string over to Bob. Bob uses the public key of Alice and sees the message back. This proves uh, a certain thing. First of all, Alice is using a private key, and Bob is decrypting it and seeing the message. That means it is Alice who sent the message. Nobody else could have written it. So uh, this is this scheme is called uh, digital signatures, and digital signatures are enforceable in a court of law today. Basically, uh, it, on the flip side, even Alice cannot claim that she did not send that message. So it is really uh, Alice has the private key, and nobody else can produce that signature. So application and blockchain goes as follows. Um, Digital signatures are used to authenticate ownership and uh, payment addresses are going to be generated by public keys. So let's look at in greater detail. So Alice has an uh, address just below his uh, image and Bob has another address below her, below, sorry, Alice has a below her image and Bob has below his image. And then Alice wants to send 10 bitcoins to Bob. Well, what, he do, what she does is um, she creates this transaction. Basically, that transaction can be created by anybody. Alice sending 10 bitcoins to Bob. What makes it valid is the digital signature. 
So that key moving there and signing it, it can only be done by us and nobody else. So the funds in Alice's address can only be used by Alice, by no one else. Okay, so let's say for now, let's look at the second problem, the hard to fabricate problem. Let's say there's a thief and he wants to steal the funds. Well, so we can create, create these transactions very easily, but signing these transactions are very hard. So one way to solve this problem is brute force, but this is infeasible, this is really hard. That's why the courts are uh, enforcing this. Uh, and, and, and the underlying uh, idea behind it is one of my functions, which is easy to uh, um, compute, but you cannot really work the function. You cannot really find, you cannot really produce a digital signature if, if you don't have a key. Um, well, so actually there are some ways of doing this. If you have so many, so many observations, and such things actually have been happening, I mean, has been happening. But again, unless you have, when, when I'm saying like mainly transactions, I'm talking about like transactions in the in the huge numbers, like you know, ten thousands, hundred thousands numbers using the same address. So if you have that many uh, number of transactions, yes, then you may be exposing yourself to you know uh, for others to forge your signature. But if you have very few, very few transactions, it's extremely hard to force signatures, and uh, even with you know, the, that many observations. And on the first side, though, for example, you lost your private key. It doesn't necessarily mean the thief is going to steal your funds now, but your address is compromised forever. Basically, uh, the thief may decide to steal your funds you know, sometime in the future, because because he has the private key, he can anyone he can at any time he can sign off on that. So once if you realize you lost your private key, you need to move the funds to another address where the private key is not exposed. Okay, so let's uh, summarize. Uh, basically, anybody can verify ownership in the transaction. Uh, everything is available to anybody. Uh, address of the funds being spent. Is going to unlock the digital signature. It's the it's the message sent from Alice to Bob, and the address of Alice is going to unlock. That's the public key, basically. Uh, and verification is very easy. Just I just explained the verification. Uh, so if there's a transaction, it's a valid transaction. It stands to reason that nobody else but the owner of the address must have signed on it. So owning an address is equal to owning the private key on an address. And if your private key exposed, then Again, ownership is lost forever. So as long as the private keys are secure, it is practically impossible for someone to steal. So going back to the original promise, it's easy to verify ownership and very hard to fabricate. Now let's look at the, the second aspect, the ledger. Easy to transact with and hard to tamper with. The solution here is keeping everything in, not in a central place, but in many nodes, in, in all the nodes. Actually, before starting this part, I would like to just emphasize this. Today, you can just download uh, your favorite uh, cryptocurrency, the wallet for your cryptocurrency, uh, and then you can get the entire history of transactions to your computer. So you can, you can actually have access to all the transactions today. Um, so let's see how this is done. I mean, that is the power. The decentralization is the solution to the problem of easy to transact with and hard to tamper with. Let's see how it is accomplished. Uh, it is distributed systems. There are so many nodes, um, and each node has its own processor and memory, and nodes communicate with each other by messages. It's a, a network, and we can we cannot assume anything on the network. Uh, they may be they may be failing. They may be going out. New nodes are joining. Some nodes are exhibiting malicious behavior. Anything can be happening. Okay, so there are multiple designs, and we are uh, in the blockchain technology very interested in the peer-to-peer -peer design. Every node can be a server or a client. So the information is both ways, going both ways. And you must be familiar with other peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, 
such as Napster and, and others. Um, so in here, uh, in, in general, the, the compilation may be carried out by a master node or by using a shared database. So in the blockchain itself, the blockchain uh, itself is the shared database. So there is no central node. It is, uh, it is the fact that every node has the same information that gives uh, blockchain its power. Well, if everybody has the same information, then the problem is the, the problem of consensus um, is a is a is a real problem. I mean, who holds the correct data? Who can make such changes? And how are you going to enforce those rules between the nodes? So this is there could be malicious nodes. So how are you going to solve all these problems? So the blockchain approach. Uh, I was initially, you know, in the history, I was talking about proof of work. So. That is the blockchain approach solution to this. Um, if we are going to put it, uh, include a new block, that should be very hard to do. And if I'm going to explain this in detail in a few slides, so changing the ledger itself is going to be very hard because you need to solve a complex puzzle. And the first one to solve that, I mean, solving that puzzle requires a lot of effort. And solving that puzzle. This is the genius of Bitcoin uh, and blockchain. Is is uh, basically if you solve the puzzle, you are granted free money. So you don't want to lose that money. You want to uh, act honestly because if you don't act honestly, other nodes in the network is going to deny uh, what you have done. So you are going to lose that money. Uh, and because of this, tampering with the ledger becomes exponentially harder as time passes, and I will explain this again in a few slides. In general, there is no need to trust any particular central node. All the nodes basically keep the same ledger. Uh, and because of this, collective computation effort is more powerful. Uh, and rules is also agreed on collectively more uh, democratic. Uh, and it's more easy to attack. I mean, just attack one node. So, so be it. The one node is going to be down. Sure. It's you need to attack all the nodes. It's it's very hard. It's impossible. Okay. The challenge is this in the scalability. So we don't want transactions to post in hours or minutes, but we want them to post in seconds. Or some solution. So there are state channels and others, which we'll discuss in the workshop. Um, and also, I just briefly mentioned this. Uh, the, the, the system needs to provide incentives for honest behavior and penalties for malicious behavior. OK, let's see how this is done in, in little, you know, according to a little bit more detail. So the structure of the blockchain looks something like this. It's basically the name implies that. So there is, there is a block. <coughs> and there's a link to the previous block. It's a, and again, and have this idea in, in your mind, which is the, the entire history is immutable. So once there's a block, that block is not going to be removed. So this is basically just a handle name. Blocks are just you know adding to the chain or more. And each block contains several information. It's the block number, the latest transactions, and the changes because of those transactions, pointers to the previous block, and most importantly, proof of validity. That proof is very hard to obtain. You have to obtain it after you know solving a very hard math, math puzzle. And after spending that much efforts, you don't want to act maliciously because otherwise you're going to lose the financial incentive you're otherwise going to gain. So that's the penalty, and that's the incentive to act honestly. So in more detail, let's look at the block. Each block stores a list of transactions. And just for it, um, you know, just to make it very simple, let's just consider real estate transactions. In a real estate transactions, there is a chain of ownership. Blockchain is very similar to that. There is a ch chain of ownership. And just imagine that each block contains one transaction. And uh, there is the link to the previous chain, the previous block in the chain. And the entire history basically shows that you are the current owner. So for correctness, the entire chain must be valid. And in a real estate transaction, this requires checking every bit of information there. So 
this is basically uh, kind of uh, requires you know looking into all of the details. So again, cryptography uh, helps us to solve these problems. Uh, basically, um, what we can do is think of the input here as the entire history, and cryptography hash functions take the history and digest it into a small string, random looking string. Remember the guard time uh, uh, that I was explaining in the beginning? So it's exactly like that. There is an entire history, and it can be digested into one string, and you can only produce that string if you have an exact history. Otherwise, you cannot. So uh, using this, basically verifying the entire history is very easy. And you only need um, the, the, the validity of the current, um, current transactions. So maintaining the Ethereum blockchain is done by miners. Again, creating a block is granted after hard work. So financial incentives are there. Honest miners identify the longest chain as the current ledger. And because of the longest chain rule, uh, if you want to change some block in the past, you have to do much more, much, much more work than is going to be impossible to do. So it's really, basically, ledger is practically a bad dollar. It's not. In the theoretical sense, it's not truly a penalty, but it's extremely impossible to change it. This can happen, I mean, changing it can happen in a 51% attack, and uh, again, we're going to discuss this in the workshop. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, blockchain solution offers, uh, I mean, it solves the problem in two ways. Cryptography offers uh, uh, how to secure ownership and this new system uh, secures the ledger. So using cryptography, uh, we can say, you know, I'm, I have some funds, and if I want to send some funds, anybody who wants to send my funds has to have the private key. This is the security of ownership. And anybody can verify it. So it's, it's easy to verify, hard to replicate. Distributed systems. It's trustless, trustless distributed public ledger. Everybody has a copy of the ledger. Uh, I told you. You can just go today and download the entire history. You can basically have the same history. So uh, because also creating a block is very hard, it is much harder to modify earlier blocks in blockchain. And it's constantly audited by peers. So the ledger is extremely secure. I mean, it's, uh, it's much, much more secure than anything that we have. OK, so at this point, I would like to uh, explain some of the applications. and. Um, uh, cryptocurrencies are, are the most basic ones, and uh, then comes the smart contracts. I explained slightly asset management, identity verification, verification, lottery, voting, decentralized exchanges, and many more I'm going to discuss in the workshop. Okay, smart homes, smart cards. I talked about the real estate transactions, and let's see how that can be done in blockchain technology and how easy that it's going to be. So ownership information can be recorded on the blockchain itself. Data can be stored. It's basically a database that's Everybody owns the same database. And exchange of ownership, money, keys, everything can be transferred in the same single transaction. So on top of this, crucial information related to the asset can also be recorded on the blockchain, which, which does not exist in the current setting. For example, past insurance claims, the electricity charges, anything can be stored. Because of the security of the ledger, any information, any mutability of the ledger, any information stored in the ledger cannot be modified later. I mean, nobody can ch go back and change. This is this is very strong. This is very uh, powerful, uh, and uh, this is why blockchain is to lead the future. Okay, let's see another application: identity voting, uh, lottery and voting. So uh, to prove that you are indeed uh, yourself, right? <laughs> uh, you need a photo ID or a passport, and this is basically uh, produced by the government. Uh, but again, this information can be stored on the blockchain, and what you only need is to have the private key. That's it. If you have the private key, if it is secure, you can just prove that you are you. And actually, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, he, he, because of he was, uh, you know, he was the first miner. Uh, we know his public addresses, so there were some claims about the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto based on the use of their private, his private keys. That's basically, you know, going to the application of identity. 
Let's see another application. This time to the exchanges. Um, well, in an exchange, well, you have to put the money in the exchange, and then you need to expect the exchange is going to be conducting everything. But then, because of the central, uh, the, the central uh, part of the uh, entire setup, attacks are very easy. And because of those attacks, um, the, the funds could be lost. So such incidents can be exchanging assets using an escrow on the blockchain itself. And the swaps will be carried out by both parties on the transaction. So um, again, we're going to talk about the details in the workshop, but this is, this is, there is very much ongoing work currently. And lastly, um, the same technology can be used in a private blockchain, where now I'm going to take off the, uh, in a private setting, there is, it's not decentralized anymore. There is a trusted uh, entity because of, because of the privacy, um, and because of the privacy, and because that the, the the parties involved really trust in the uh, the entity in the uh, uh, in the private setting. Uh, the problem of consensus is not there. The blockchain is truly an account of ledger. The the party, the central party, is going to be the one that's going to be modifying, and because of the central trust. It is going to be issued with blocks easily. The problem here is that that central entity is prone to attacks. So there is the, I mean, there is some gain, but then there is there's some, there's a trade off. But in general, the, the, the two aspects is, is, is basically achieved by cryptography and the decentralization of the entire network. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm going to be answering your questions uh, later. Um, Thanks. So, how much of this was new? How much of this was kind of something you already knew about? Kind of new, some of these aspects for blockchain. Now, when you talk about fintech, it's not just about the finance part or the trading part. There's a core technology piece involved, right? And then, uh, when you talk about investing, you just focus on um, you know, the financial aspects of it, but there's a rigor of science involved. And until you actually understand the science, you know, it's just going to be a gamble. Now, talking about gambling, um, we thought that it would be a good idea to talk about how cryptocurrencies are actually behaving in the last year or so. And then uh, you know, one of the case studies, I thought uh, Anish would be um, introducing would be to kind of think about how can you analyze the cryptocurrencies and see their behavior compared to that of traditional assets. Uh, Anish um, is not new to the Boston Quant folks. And he's been in Boston area for a long time. Uh, he used to be a quant at Northfield, uh, and he also was at ITG before. Um, he loves to play the guitar, and I think uh, I just added that comment. I don't know if you've seen that comment yet. I, I just saw that now. You just saw that now, so yeah, like he didn't get clear of me but uh, he's an accomplished clinical guitar player, and uh, we wanted to see if we can have a concert here, but then the next time we'll definitely see if we can bring in this guitar. Uh, so Anish, without further ado, do you want to come and uh, talk about your part of the presentation? things that I'm doing is uh, I'm going to be teaching Shri's machine learning and quant finance uh, workshops in the spring. And so Shri asked me to come up with a few examples of cryptocurrencies because we're talking about blockchain. So uh, uh, let's dig into it. Okay. So these cryptocurrencies, I feel like they're, they're multiplying like cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
I, I don't like them. Uh, I'll say that I don't like them. But they're constantly multiplying, and I think they're now probably a thousand of these, and it's it seems uh, endless. And when I see this happening, uh, and, and I, I would say I'm, I'm more on the cranky side of things, so I'm not. I'm not oh, you can't hear me back there. Uh, you want to keep the microphone here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll go. Okay. So, uh, so I'm a bit of a crank. Uh, I'm not crazy about these things. And the first thing that it reminded me of when I when I saw this uh, was this. So all these daily deal sites that were happening about 10 years ago, and that was a I would say a really undignified time of dining out in Boston because at the end of the meal you suavely take out a piece of paper and you, and you hand it to the person. <laughs> it looked like a free voucher. So I, I'm glad that that's disappeared. Um, but back to cryptocurrencies. I think the first question, uh, the first question you have with cryptocurrencies, and this is if you think about it, thinking about them as an investment, is uh, what's determining the price? And, and does anyone have any suggestions on what, what's determining the price? Demand. Supply and demand. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just the coin policy, the monetary policy, the coin. But the, 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 in terms of how fast the supply can grow. It, it, that's one of the answers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is my understanding, which is not right, necessarily, but this is how I see it. So this is really what's deterring the price. So you have uh, uh, you have an investor, and that investor says, I am going to buy some Bitcoin. So investor buys Bitcoin. And now investor has made a lot of money on it. Investor has a fancy car, has a nice house. And then his friend sees it. And then the friend sees how much money he made, and then he goes through the cycle. And so I feel like we're in a circle. Uh, I'll just tell you that uh, there's the non-investing skeptic here. Uh, that's me. And where's the non-investing skeptic? He, he's riding a bus. <laughs> Right. But, but uh, are there people have more suggestions on what the valuation is? Because I, I don't see it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see, see what's driving it. You mentioned the supply is limited. Uh, but, but I'd like to hear more. Yes? Network effect. And the network effect? It's that, that whole um, atmosphere you just explained. Yeah. The more people get into the network of, of whether buying or selling or Order for a store of value, yeah. that just feeds up on itself. So, like a fiat currency. Okay. Yeah. That sounds also all the pump and dump strategies that are going on with the different exchanges. Yeah. Based on the uh, liquidity of any one coin, you can pump it up and or down. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's that's a uh, yeah. So it's, it's uh, a speculation basically. Different kinds of speculation. Uh, yes. Uh, future applications. Future applications. Yeah. Um, Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I'll, I'll take it, yeah, please. There's a time advantage to a frictionless economy if it uses a currency. Okay, so so that, uh, can you say, or can you, can you explain it a little more? If I can transfer money faster, that's yeah. better for my company, that lowers my cost, that has an advantage in there. Yeah, so that's the reason that you'd want to do it. Uh, but but why why would that affect the price so much? It's just it's it's a useful tool. And as education grows, more people will be participating. Okay. What shadow economy? Yeah. And so shadow economy for sure. Yeah yeah. So if you want to do something under the radar, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Then it's it's highly desirable. Uh, yes. Confidence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> confidence. <laughs> yeah. What drives the value of everything? Everything. Every money, every fiat currency, every investment, yeah. every asset, confidence. Yeah. Trust. Trust. Trust is trust. another way of saying confidence. Okay. So uh, I, if, if that's trust, then I, 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 I'm back to, to this picture. I don't quite trust it. Yes. Perceived concerns. Many people see this somewhat less, um, less uh, regulated or less controlled than QE and like the actual. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll try to rephrase it and you can tell me if I'm wrong. So for example, if you're in a place where your currency is not stable, if you're in Venezuela, yeah. then, then this is highly attractive because your currency is not going to disappear. Yeah. Uh, I thought I saw another hand somewhere. One of the 
some countries when they block their assets, uh, when there's capital control, yeah. this is the fastest way they can that extrapolate their, their assets. Yeah, also. so it's kind of a, a safe haven. Yeah. So it's some sort of safe haven, which is also related to the, this. Uh, Okay. Okay. Well, okay. so 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 the price, you know, uh, I guess I guess there are reasons for it. Some other considerations is that there, the mechanism that's underlying this thing can be easily replicated, right? That's why you see so many of these coins. So why should a particular coin be so strong? You know, at some point maybe some other coin takes over for some reason. This is why I say just as someone who's considering investing, or, or not considering investing in these things, but these would be reservations I have. Okay. Uh, at some point, if it gets large enough, is the government going to cede control over currency? Because this is power. And I think there's a lot of hacking power that governments have. And if, if this becomes very strong, I think it's vulnerable. Uh, if you're actually using it to price something, I mean, you want to price something in, in something that's stable, not something that's all over the place. So it limits its use for pricing. And then there's a, there are articles about hacks. There's a venture fund that lost $30 million about a year and a half ago in Ethereum. Right? And I think that was a, I, I don't know the stuff that well, but that was a, uh, a reason for a fork to, to make them whole again. Uh, recently, there's, recently, in the last couple of days, there's this wallet. There's a block. I think there was something uh, with respect to that you couldn't access. Yeah. Uh, like during the end, it's, it's, the, our, it's the parity wallet. It's a multi sig, <coughs> multiple signatures yeah. that uh, locked up. But yeah. Somebody hacked it and then they uh, substituted their own ID for it and then they deleted their ID and just disappeared. Oh, just everyone. disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I, I was thinking just when I was watching uh, Guru's uh, talk, is if this private key controls everything, then, then it's if you it's like yeah. a magic ring from Lord of the Rings, and if you have it, you can you can enter everything. But I, I don't know the technology that well. I'm looking at it more just as some sort of final. Oh, I grabbed all the all the signatures in the wallet, and then said, "Oh wait, a minute, I didn't mean to do that." Yeah. So we deleted his private key. Yeah. And then the 50, 156 million disappeared. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Volatility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, but, but there's con so contrary to that, their derivatives are coming. So this is on the CME. They're doing futures on, on uh, Bitcoin, and I think their options, their options on another exchange, or, or they're coming. So it's you know the, it's something is being built around it. It's it's not uh, it's it's not just the Homer Simpsons who are who yeah, are doing it. It's also it. legal tender in Japan, for example. So uh, what I say is well. I, I, I don't quite get it, but let's start looking at it using some just basic machine learning. Uh, and this is going to be basic. In the workshop, if you want to do more advanced machine learning, come to the workshop in, in the spring. So let's look at some data. Uh, oh, sorry, there's some extra slides here just describe what we do. We're going to look at clustering. And I, I don't know, probably most of you are familiar with this, but basic clustering is you have your data, you have data for a bunch of different things, and you look at similarity in the data. To, to, to assign similar things together. So it's, it comes entirely from the data. So it's clustering. Uh, another is dimension reduction. And that's, you know, for example, uh, say Cape Cod looks like my arm, right? And it's this two-dimensional thing. But I could simplify the dimension of Cape Cod just as a line. And that, that captures a lot of the information about where you are in Cape Cod. So I'm 40 miles out in Cape Cod. And you don't really care about the width so much. So we'll get some dimensionality reduction. Uh, visualization. And now you have this data is in some sort of high dimensional space and you want to look at it and make sense of it. So you need you know, this thing that's that you can't see because there are too many dimensions. You want to be able to project it down to something that's that gives you some feel for what's going on. And we'll do that as well. Okay. Uh, and this actually sure sure added some slides for me. So I'm going to have a look. Uh, the clustering we're going to use, uh, some of you are probably familiar with k-means. This is kind of the most common clustering, and it's been around for a long time. This one is affinity propagation, and it's from a paper in 2007. And the, the benefit of this is that you don't have to fix the number of clusters, and it runs in 1 100th of the time. So you get to a better solution 
you don't fix the clusters and it runs much faster. And this is a paper and it's available on scikit-learn. Okay, and then for the dimension reduction, we're just going to do principal component analysis. And an example of the principal component al analysis is if you have Cape Cod and you want to break it into two directions, one direction would be uh, heading this way, the long way, and the other direction would be going horizontally. So principal components will find the direction that the data mostly lies on, that's the first direction, and then it strips that out and then looks at the next direction that the data lies on and it strips that out and it goes to the, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, for the visualization is this manifold learning. And that's when, uh, I'll be repeating myself here, where you have this data in a very high dimensional space and you want to project it down to something, typically two or three dimensions that you can actually see. Because you know, try to see four dimensions and it'll just fall over, <laughs> right? It doesn't make any sense. So we'll use that. Okay, and now let's look at some data. Oh, and, and, uh, we good? Okay. You can see the code? Yeah. The code is available on the website, so you can download it. Yeah, so you can, you can play with all this stuff. Uh, the, the, the first thing I would say is that I've been an R programmer for about, and I've done everything in R for about 10 years, and I know R incredibly well, and then I just switched to Python, and this was akin to, if I needed a hammer, I was using a, a wrench and, and a beating, beating, beating the, the computer with it. Uh, or the image I told my wife when I was working on it, I said, Sylvia, I feel like an American who has just gone to France for the first time. And I just wash my face in a bidet. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it kind of works, but it's not really the, the way you want to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so if this code is gonna. This is not pretty code, but it works. By the time we run the workshop in spring, we'll make sure that it's yeah. not the bidet. Yeah, yeah. And, and the one thing that's missing from this code is all the profanity that was coming out of my mouth while I was writing. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so let's look at some data. Uh, how can I scroll this? Maybe this is the most accurate. Okay, yeah. Okay. So there's just some stuff at the top, and then there's some functions here that you can use since the code is available on the on Tree's website, uh, where I'm pulling down the crypto data from Crypto Compare. So there there's some handy functions here. One is to pull down the, the the coins that have the highest volume, if you want to select that way. And then another is to get the history. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go down. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, these are just questions I had in my head exploring the data. I can get the, the cryptocurrencies trading in different currencies and I wanna know different base currencies. So for example, US dollar to Bitcoin or Japanese yen to Bitcoin. And I want to know, is there some sort of effect with the cross currency? Right. And so these are the top five. The, the top five uh, cryptocurrencies by volume uh, with, with, by, by base currency. So this is USD, and almost everything is in Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin right here. And then Bitcoin Cash and then Ethereum, Litecoin, and then Ethereum Classic. So that's what's happening in the US. And Europe, uh, it's similar, but now you have this uh, Ripple, XRP. Ripple is there. In Japan, everything is Bitcoin, and there's some other stuff. And then some of these things trade only into Bitcoin. So this is Bitcoin as your cross currency, and it's Bitcoin Cash, and, and a few other currencies. But, what I wonder when seeing this, and, and China looks a lot like this. I think China is almost 100% Bitcoin. Yeah, it's uh, is that maybe there's some sort of because certain countries trade in certain cryptocurrencies, is there some some connection to the economics of a particular country? You know, so maybe there's some hedging. You could do some hedging there. You could, you could figure out 
<coughs> something wrong with the economic cycles. I, I don't know. But that's this. This is something that comes to mind when I see that. And now I'm just going to pull down some price data. Uh, I'm looking at the top 50 <coughs> cryptocurrencies in the U.S. by volume, U.S. volume, and I'm going to get their prices. I, I hear there, I didn't look at it at all, but I hear there is an arbitrage opportunity. And there are different exchanges, and it's, you know, but, but I, I didn't look at it at all. Okay, so I, I grabbed the, the, the top 50 currencies versus, versus US dollar by volume. And uh, I want to look at those. And the, this is their first trade date in 2017. So some of these Bitcoin, of course, is older than that. But 2017, this is their first trade date. And one thing I see is that so many of these things are new. So Bitcoin has been, been around. Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash was, I think, a fork. Ethereum has been around. Litecoin. But then you start going down. And then this one is in June. Uh, this is in June. This is in October. So there's not that much data on a lot of these things. I mean, you, you can get tick data or, or you know, very, very short interval data, but there's not a long history. Okay, so I'm only going to look at things that we had that were traded for the whole past year. OK. So let's, uh, let's just look at one of these. I took Dogecoin uh, because I, I like the name, and, and, and also that it, it went down. So they don't always just go up. So this is one that it went up and it went down, and, and that can happen. And and now let's do some. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to operate the touchpad. Okay. Yeah. So so now I'm going to do some clustering. And I'm going to take these cryptocurrencies and I'm going to add some equities to that as well. So I added, I just looked up what are the 10 largest companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Exxon Mobil. It, it, you can take this code and put whatever companies you want in there. And what I want to see is, do these cryptocurrencies behave like any of the, the companies? So if I throw these into clusters, am I going to see cryptos with some companies? Am I going to see, and I don't, I, Ideally, also throw some commodities in here, some exchange rates, and, and, and to try to get a, a map of what's going on in the world. You know, do the cryptos behave like other instruments? So, oh, oh, it's a little touchy, huh? Yes. Oh, okay, we gotta go, go down a little bit. Uh, there we go. So, so I did some clustering. I did some clusters down here. Maybe it's because it's, it's a big one. There. Yeah. Okay, we got it up about this much. Uh, so I did the clustering, and the first cluster is all cryptocurrencies. Uh, second, you see tech stocks plus J and J, and the third is JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, and ExxonMobil. So in the clustering, they're their own animal. So this is just what the inference tells us that these are these are something different. And now we're going to visualize what the clusters look like. Visualize what the clusters look like, and so this is a the 2D representation of this. I think it's a 20 by 20 uh, space, right? 20 dimensional space, and you can see the tech stocks are close together. J and J somewhere here. The financials are here. Exxon Mobil and the cryptos are their own animal. So just a, a quick view tells us these cryptos are something different than these equities. And what are the axes? Uh, the, the, this is actually—it's not an axis. So, so these things are living 
in a 20-dimensional space, right? And then this is a view of this 20-dimensional space, projecting it down to two dimensions to try to, try to capture the structure. And, and the actual details of that process, I, I don't know off the top of my head. There's also this new technique called V-sneak, which everyone talks about. So it's kind of a similar technique where you're kind of projecting a high-dimensional visualization into a two-dimensional picture. But if you did some dimension reduction, you wound up with a couple of defined dimensions. Right. So you, know, you should be able to figure out what it's doing. Right. So the, you're saying, for example, if we did this principal components where you, you're, you're taking uh, orthogonal directions, then I could say that this is one, one direction going this way, and this is another one going this, this way. This is more of a representation of, of everything. So it's, it's not just a it's not, it's not a, it's not a plane there. It's, it's a way of capturing the structure. Yeah. Well, there are some yeah. features that go into that. One of the 20 dimensions that you put in. Yeah, so this is, uh, what, 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 uh, uh, what determines the similarity is correlation. So it's, it's the, the correlation of the variation. Right? And this is a similarity. And this is a correlation matrix. And now we, the correlation matrix is the distance. is a little distance there. And actually, the details of getting from that to this, I'm not quite sure. But it's, it's some sort of, uh, I think, uh, finding uh, uh, a lower dimensional probability distribution that, that's close to what, what this thing is. Is the volatility similar? Is the volatility similar? Is the volatility similar? Everything is scaled to the same volatility. So we're, we're on the correlation matrix. Do you know how much volatility Yes. Yeah, yeah. So every picture of volatility. Another feature is are you going to economic markers or what other types of dimensions are going into? Oh, so this, this, this is. Um, I, I, actually, I should skip through the code there. So what it is is we take the variation. Of, so that just we're going to take the, the closed minus open for each, secure, each of these securities. And then we're going to normalize that so that the standard deviation is 1. Right? And then we're going to take the covariance of that. So it's just basically the correlation of, of all these variations. And, and that's everything that goes in there. Yeah. I can try something? Yes. So the thing is, like, when you're talking about cross-sectional data sets, you have multiple features. And then at that point, you have distance measures like Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, and things like that. So here we are working with time series data. Right? So when you have time series data, you're working with open, low, high, etc. So you basically have columns of data. And in order to kind of use a distance measure, you're using correlations of distance measure. In order to get there, you're putting together correlation measures. So is that just telling us that the correlations of the cryptocurrency is a lot higher than correlation rate? They're similar. Yeah, it, it's They're saying similar. That, that these are all in the same, uh, these are all close to each other, and and they're quite far from here and far from here as, as well. Okay, and now we're going to do just a PCA for d dimension reduction. So this is finding finding the uh, uh, the directions that have the most explanatory power. And I'm just going to show it to you for for three of the cryptos and three of the the, uh, the equities because otherwise there'll be so many charts. So going along here are the different factors, meaning different directions, north, east, you know, some other direction or X, Y, Z. You can get it that way. And then we're going to see how much of the movement is in each of these directions. So the cryptos, almost everything is in this first factor, right? and, and the scale on these. Is, is different, and that's because uh, I'm still getting uh, up to speed on Python. Uh, but you can see the cryptos, they all have a similar profile. So they're loading a lot on this first factor, and then kind of trails off. These first three are cryptos, and now let's go down to these two, which are equities. Okay. The equities, so this, this is zero here. It was one on the crypto, so this, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. The equities aren't loading on this first factor. These are they're in a different space. And, and the shape is, is totally different than the cryptos. So I do think they're different animals. I don't, I don't think they, they behave equity-like. Um, and, and this is, you know, if you want to get more into it, come to the workshop and we'll, we'll get our hands really dirty and do interesting things. But 
this is a good deal. So uh, we just wanted to share, thank you. We just wanted to share a couple of you know, kinds of case studies you can be dealing with. So on one side we have So it's kind of hard to do a full case study in an hour or a half, but we just wanted to give you a preview. Right? Um, I would not advocate to take this code, put it into your system, and trade tomorrow morning. <laughs> just because we have a couple of indicators. Okay? Um, if you are an investment manager, you have some more assets to look at, some more charts to look at tomorrow morning. Um, this is coming, you know, people are going to be incorporating futures into their portfolios in the next couple of months as it becomes legit to incorporate and then, you know, uh, Dan will probably in the next couple of years talk to a high net worth individual and say, oh, you have a million dollars sitting and you're not doing anything with it. Do you mind losing your money tomorrow morning? No, then here's Bitcoin, you could potentially put it in this asset class maybe. Uh, but the key idea is, you know, rather than just kind of taking it as, okay, here's a fad, let's try and see what what's happening in there, uh, take an educated approach, you know, get to know what's happening. So that's why we are taking these two approaches, one on the fin side and another one on the tech side. What Duru presented was on the tech side of things, where you kind of get out of the hood, understand what's actually driving it. You know, when I joined Citigroup, I joined the technology group, and I know how hard it is to implement a quality technology solution. In fact, my first algorithm, when it got deployed, um, the whole system broke, and my code was responsible for the breaking of the whole system because I had introduced a lock, and only one trade could flow through, and the design was to trade $50 million worth of trade. I still remember the day when six people were standing around me asking why it was not working. Um, <laughs> But that's an experience to have, you know, when institutions build distributed systems, distributed systems is a hard problem. Cryptography is a hard problem. And if you do not understand, I think that's what's happening, you know, when you see VC funds investing in Bitcoin and blockchain related startups, they don't get the technology. They just think it's a cool idea, let's just get the idea going. Um, so you need to do the due diligence. When investments uh, are done using these technologies, you need to understand what's happening. Uh, so that's on the technology side of things. And the other side is the finance side of things, wherein you know, we being financial professionals really need to understand the asset dynamics, being able to kind of understand what's actually in the best interest of our clients. Do we have the necessary skills to analyze and incorporate these into our portfolios? Are we doing, you know, holding on to the fiduciary responsibilities for our clients and basically thinking about these being the right instruments? But it's taking an educated approach to going and approaching these problems. Um, hope to see you guys back when we do more of these kinds of workshops, and hope to see more of you when we do these workshops in, in the spring. We're doing a two-day workshop on blockchain, another two-day workshop on uh, the AI and machine learning side of things, and our goal is to basically make sure that you have the right tools and skills to basically analyze these problems and come up with your own conclusions, rather than just be you know, slaves of the news, which when you just keep seeing the news cycle and just keep hearing about things, making your decisions based on the news cycles. Okay? Uh, thanks so much for coming, and we'll be hanging around if there are any questions.
the preservation of capital. So I didn't kind of let up on just talking about a lot of stuff. I kind of let you guys. I don't know how to do it. I'm not transaction based in any way. If I get one thing out of that, it's all the pleasure. Yeah, it's also a few more price. So once we've got the green, it's going to be playing. Now it's going to be kind of academic. So we talk, we talk, yeah. we talk about his entrepreneurship, we talk about the things going on with the people, the practice, and the since mid-September, it's absolutely cool. So, 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 Hello. Hey. Anish. Anish, pleasure to meet you, Anish. 